I tie this very much not just to Africa but also to post-2015, the fact that now Africa is referred to not so much as hopeless as as hopeful. Uh, And this is very much informed uh, by the uh, new global government's PhD uh, at UMass and certainly I think both today's uh, discussions uh, and our first class confirms just how dynamic this whole field uh, of transnational private forms of of governance uh, is uh, because of all the reasons that have been uh, suggested. And I think this very much relates to the whole question that Vivian started off with yesterday, namely the nature of of neoliberalism, which it seems to me is uh, a work in progress in terms of of the way in which it is being redefined by these myriad uh, agencies. Uh, I'm also involved in the North-South Institute back in uh, Ottawa uh, on natural resource uh, governance, uh, and certainly uh, the transnational dimension has been very much influenced by working in the uh, Caribbean, uh, precisely because of of how transnational (coughs) political economies, political cultures, etc., are there. Uh, So I found this discussion this morning very useful in terms of emerging frameworks for both categorizing and and evaluating uh, this proliferating forms of of governance, which of course themselves are in in progress. Uh, And so one of my comments will be to go back to Partnership Africa Canada in Ottawa and look at the way in which some of these agencies, some of these networks are themselves um, continuously um, evolving. So in terms of the question yesterday about drivers, it does seem to me that, that For once, Africa has something to uh, contribute, and certainly it seems to me that some of the roles of academics, uh, again, we can question how academic they may be in some of these uh, activities, uh, are themselves of of growing uh, importance. Uh, And clearly, the African case can be contrasted with Latin America, uh, with Asia, with the EU, uh, etc. so this, this paper, I hope, uh, goes back to the initial question that, that Vivian challenged us with in terms of transnational policy uh, networks. Uh, and certainly uh, in the case, uh, cases that I want to deal with, uh, it seems to me have something to contribute. In the case of the Partnership Africa-Canada, which was very involved in the Kimberley process on blood diamonds and now is very much involved in, in terms of conflict minerals and the International Conference on the Great Lakes region, uh, it's a very interesting case of the way in which uh, NGOs themselves evolve from advocacy uh, to implementation, evaluation, etc. And to some extent, therefore, uh, becoming agents, uh, they themselves change their their character, their role, their structure, their accountability, uh, etc. Uh, and Martin isn't here, but I, I comment uh, at the end Uh, on Dodd-Frank reforms uh, around supply chains uh, connected to um, conflict uh, minerals. Uh, So the paper builds on the early work of Dingworth uh, and the more recent work, the encyclopedic encyclopedia of Hale and Held, uh, on the way in which the global south has tended to be excluded from some of these private transnational forms of governance. Uh, particularly looking uh, at the World Commission on Dams, which was the only World Commission to be located in the Global South, and the only World Commission uh, to include multinational companies as well as civil societies, uh, analysts, uh, etc. But I think that this, in a sense, is is also in part because the world is changing, and so what we mean by third world, the rise of the BRICS, etc., certainly impacts where we expect to find and, and evaluate transnational uh, private governance. The paper looks uh, goes from the Kimberley process, one of the earlier uh, examples of, of um, transnational private governance, through the forestry and marine certification schemes, uh, and on to uh, some African cases that I want to, in a sense, begin a process of, of uh, evaluating. Uh, and I think that obviously the Kimberley process, the role of the international campaign to ban landmines uh, was itself in a sense an interesting early example uh, of an epistemic um, community. Uh, Typical I think of the way in which this whole sector uh, of private transnational governance uh, is evolving and growing and developing uh, 
uh, is the quite impressive, uh, extensive, heterogeneous ice seal alliance, which now includes forestry, marine, um, fair trade, uh, but also a whole range of services, uh, agencies that are not-for-profit uh, forms of evaluation, uh, accounting, uh, etc. Uh, and so I think that this whole, in a sense, transnational governance sector is itself uh, evolving in, in very interesting and becoming more institutionalized in very interesting uh, ways. So I want to go on and look particularly at the six uh, agencies one of which uh, Yulia has already discussed, uh, that are of growing importance in Africa and I think re reflect the way in which Africa is no longer quite as dependent as it might have been uh, and reflects the, the development of a new strand of analysis around Africa that looks at African agency rather than African dependency uh, and in turn reflects the, the uh, plausibility uh, of Africa no longer being composed of fragile states but increasingly of developmental states. So the first example is the Intergovernmental Forum, which has Canadian as well as other roots. Uh, it's mining policy framework, particularly focused uh, on mining uh, and natural resource ministries uh, and industries uh, and, uh, and labor. So although it is broader than Africa and is primarily southern, um, it does have a particular Africa focus and, and concentration. Um, secondly, as Yulia suggested, EITI, uh, coming particularly out of the, the G8 to G20, uh, particularly uh, being a very much a multi-stakeholder uh, initiative uh, with all the major multinationals, uh, international go governmental organizations, sovereign wealth funds, Transparency International Revenue Watch, uh, etc. Uh, and as she suggested, over half uh, of the almost 40 countries uh, are... are uh, are African. So it has a particular focus on, on revenues uh, as well as resources. Thirdly, um, the um, Natural Resource Charter, which in a sense is a very interesting uh, example uh, coming uh, out of the World Bank and the role of academics in terms of networks, uh, Paul Collier uh, and others, developing a dozen precepts uh, in terms of good natural resource governance in some ways because of its roots it's quite authoritative, may not necessarily be so representative, uh, and I think in many ways parts of the Global South, particularly Africa, uh, have reservations uh, about it. Fourthly, the African mining uh, vision, uh, which is a quite uh, dramatic uh, example uh, of the way in which developmental states uh, in Africa are, are increasingly defining their own evolution. So this is very much a continental uh, perspective. Um, it, it developed out of a very impressive study of the mining sector uh, by an international study group and in a way is, is an African uh, attempt at assertion con by contrast to more global um, initiatives and I think is, is symptomatic of African agency uh, and the way in which the continent in part because of the BRICS and demand is increasingly uh, evolving. And finally, to go back to, to Martin yesterday, the Securities and Exchange Commission coming out of the Dodd-Frank uh, Act, uh, Section 1502, uh, very new and will have all sorts of implications, and as he said in terms of, of uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, is itself a remarkably impressive and weighty document, uh, requiring um, companies, particularly in IT, to report on the supply chains uh, of the three T's um, the the um, the the, the uh, uh, conflict minerals uh, that are so important, like tertallium, uh, in terms of, of um, producing uh, IT uh, equipment, cell phones, etc. And in turn, this has been encouraged by the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region, Partnership Africa, uh, Global Witness, uh, etc. And finally, let me just mention. Uh, Chatham House has just produced a very impressive report on resources futures uh, and that um, uh, also uh, is a very useful background in terms of the next uh, few years and decades in terms of resource conflict, the, the political economy of, of, uh, of resources.
but in its pr uh, proposed R30 group of important resource producing and importing states only has one African state, uh, namely Nigeria. So the paper is particularly concerned with uh, the possibility of a rational division of labor amongst these several uh, or competing uh, uh, scenarios uh, in terms of transnational governance uh, for the um, uh, for the continent's uh, development post 2015. Uh, and I note at the bottom that, that obviously the responses of the BRICS in the next 11, uh, even though Jim O'Neill has now retired, uh, will be of increasing uh, importance, particularly symbolically with the fifth BRICS summit being held next month uh, in South Africa. Finally then, let me just uh, go back to the whole question of, of frameworks. Uh, there is, of course, no hegemonic or agreed definition, uh, but as Julia said, certainly in, in our discussion at the PhD, uh, uh, looking at governance beyond uh, the state. Uh, and it seems to me with the type of analysis we've had today, clearly Hale and Held will have to expand their 50 cases in, into many more uh, in their second and, and future uh, editions. Of course, the interactions that cross national borders uh, can be informal and illegal, uh, as in blood diamonds uh, and conflict uh, minerals. Uh, and certainly, uh, if we go on to uh, Farid Zakaria, uh, the role of the rest in a post-American world uh, as China and India uh, increasingly displace the US. Uh, I also mention, of course, the growing concern, given all these uh, proliferating, uh, morphing uh, forms of transnational governance uh, around questions of accountability, their democracy, their transparency. And it seems to me that the, the role uh, around Africa and elsewhere of One World Trust, uh, of building global democracy, uh, of the INGO Accountability Charter and ISO 26000 uh, are of uh, increasing importance. Two final points. One is um, that clearly uh, all of this relates to the evolution uh, of the BRICS themselves being involved in terms of, of environmental questions through BASIC. Uh, and Jan Nedevin petersi uh, has, I think, in a sense, at least provocatively, captured some of this by suggesting uh, that the world is, is decreasingly uh, characterized by a north-south axis and increasingly by an, an east-south turn. Uh, and at Easter uh, weekend uh, at the UMass campus, uh, he will be talking with others uh, and it's an open invitation to look at the whole world uh, of emerging powers, uh, emerging markets, uh, emerging societies. And it does seem to me that, that this discussion uh, has now suggested the increasing importance of this continuously evolving uh, and emerging set of transnational actors. Thank you.